Biobalance HealthCast episode 260. Why are we told that testosterone is bad? Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. When Dr. Maupin and I were in Europe last year promoting our book, uh, The Secret Female Hormone, we had an opportunity to go to Cambridge, which is one of the oldest universities in England, and visit the Cambridge bookstore and library. And this is like the oldest continuing operating campus bookstore and library Mm -hmm. in England. And while we were prowling around there, which is a fascinating place to go, you got into the medical section, which, you know, I, I was As over in the history section or something. <laughs> you were in the medical section. And you found this book on testosterone, which is a tome. And it is. It weighs about eight pounds. And you actually bought it and carried it home rather than packed it because it would cost too much yeah. to ship. <laughs> uh, and because you were you were reading it. and It was in the medical it was in the medical school section. So yes. they were using this for teaching. Yes. And it it has some of the most intensely focused research data that we have been able to find about testosterone yeah, and the replacement able, of testosterone. Able to find anything like that here. And, and so we were talking about why. Why are we not finding this book here? Why are we not finding summaries of these reports? Why do doctors mm-hmm. not know what's in this book? And in part because we're frustrated with how to get the message of hormone replacement and in particular testosterone replacement out to the public and to doctors when there is a systemic resistance to it. And so this week we're talking about our blog and and our uh, podcast is going to be titled, If Testosterone is So Good, Why Does Organized Medicine Resist Acknowledging It? Mm -hmm. Are they lying to us? And if so, why? And we wanted to start with, I wanted to start with having Kathy either read or identify the salient points that are quoted in a two-paragraph section in this book, uh, lauding the positive benefits of testosterone replacement in aging populations and in those populations that, for other reasons, have lost their production of testosterone. And and how it is, uh, it seems to be, something that is a critical intervention point at the onset of the aging cascade that can prevent a lot of the illnesses of aging either from occurring or it can minimize the impact of them in very positive and beneficial ways, which is the the argument that we make in our book. Uh, so I'd like for you to start with that if you can. I mean, there, yeah. you want to read it or you want to recite key points, however. I'll recite key points. Okay. So, But I want you to know that this is from a very large chapter in this very large book, which has extensive footnotes, has extensive resources, references to articles from all over the world, and big population articles. And and the book is hard to remember the title. It's just called Testosterone. Testosterone. And it's it's a fourth edition, Eberhard Nieschlag and Herman M. Baer, Cambridge University Press. So this is what the article, or excuse me, the chapter on testosterone replacement, and it deals with both men and women, men primarily, of Mm -hmm. course. So my question is, for organized medicine and for you, if testosterone can make us live longer, decrease insulin resistance and diabetes by 44% if we replace it, decrease the thickness of our arteries, which is means decrease our chance of having a stroke or heart attack, Mm -hmm. decrease our LDL cholesterol, the bad one that causes heart disease, decrease the rate of stroke, suppress inflammation, decrease fibrinogen, which causes blood clots, improves sexuality, improves erections, improves, for women, vaginal wetness. And the ability to be aroused. And the ability to have a sex drive. Right. Improves cardiac output for patients who have had a heart failure problem. I mean, heart failure, the muscle isn't very strong. It helps cardiac output and makes it push blood out better. It also prevents and treats Parkinson's disease by increasing dopamine levels. It improves our uh, 
our immunity. So it improves the T cells that kill cancer cells that kill uh, any kind of infection improves our ability to respond to immunizations because mm -hmm. we lose that after 70 if we don't have testosterone. But most importantly, it decreases mortality for all causes if patients take testosterone as they age. All causes. So why won't anyone put this on the front page? Well, and a cynic would suggest that perhaps it's because it is not a patentable, licensable medical invention. It's well, not there are pill. some testosterone creams, gels, patches for men, right? and they're synthetic testosterone. Mm -hmm. So they make it, it's not from a plant like the pellets that we use. Mm -hmm. It may not be the best delivery system, but <laughs> when they give this to people, they don't say testosterone as a patch has these side effects, or testosterone as a gel creates more estrogen and causes man boobs, they say testosterone. Mm -hmm. So they use a blanket statement Label. to condemn testosterone for the side effects, yet you never hear this list of all the things that hurt aging people, keep us from having our our life, our joy of living. It keeps, I mean, I didn't even mention arthritis. It was in there as well, but it keeps your joints oiled mm -hmm. so that you can get around. It keeps your muscles thick so that you don't end up with a walker. So all of these things are what happen when we age. So if you really want it, if you're a governmental agency or a, a, me a medical group and you wanted people to be healthier and you wanted one thing that would make them healthier, not a hundred drugs, wouldn't this be your focus? Wouldn't you scream this from the housetops? I would because I've learned the things that you've taught me. But as if I were a bureaucrat or uh, in either government or a big pharmacy, uh, the FDA, I'm not sure that I would because there's a systemic inertia in those institutions that resist change. And one of the underlying or fundamental conceptual reasons for that is the difference in philosophical approach to research in the United States right. as compared to Europe. Research in the United States is, is predicated on the idea that we have to prove that it has positive value. And so we have to do research that will do that. In so Europe, research to prove a point. To prove a point. And in Europe, the way they do the research is to say there's no overwhelming negative reason not to use it. It's a, it's a literally... They basically ask a question. Sci scientific spectrum. research should ask a question. Does this work right. for this reason? Mm -hmm. Or does this... Does work at all. For this work reason. at all? Why? And what are the side effects it sh if, there, if it does have any? Yes. So it should ask a question and then the research should answer it. Instead, we have... It used to be like that when I started practice. But now... All research is, is suspect because when I look at it, they're, they're trying to prove that something's true or trying to prove something's not true. And you can manipulate the data right. so much to make it say what you want it to say. And that's what we've fallen, fallen to. That's what we've, we've decreased our scientific um, curiosity down to getting paid to prove a point for a drug company or for a country. And then the FDA uses those answers, those research, I guess, uh, research Result. studies and yeah. results as their, as their measuring stick. They, they don't, do, but there, there are flaws in that, as you're pointing there's out. Lots when, of flaws. I, when I was learning to debate in high school and college, we were taught the rubric, always use statistics. Always use statistics, <laughs> and they would Dazzle say them with numbers. F figures never lie, but liars always figure. <laughs> and so, what yeah. you can do is manipulate your database. You manipulate the size of the base to make it statistically significant or insignificant, mm -hmm. whatever the results you want to have. And so, what we're finding in research today is the the uh, doctors or pharmacists who want to create something that they can patent. Uh, patent own control mm -hmm. and and earn from which i respect mm -hmm. yeah we all have to go make a out living. with a defined goal let's prove point a and then they do research to see if point a really is provable and really is valid and if they get in the middle of the research and all the data seems to be going the other direction the funding dries up 
they the study, stop. The study gets stopped. And it either There's doesn't no get published yeah. or it gets published with with a skewed result. And it, I, I wanted to go through the different ways okay. they can skew the results yeah. because that's one of them. They can stop a study and then never speak about yeah. it again. Just cut off the money. Cut off, the, And the money is cut off if they aren't proving what the person that's paying for it mm -hmm. uh, is asking. You should think of the... of, of a human being, a doctor, or a pharma pharmacist, or a, I guess, a pharmaceutical co company, as an agent looking to make a living. Mm -hmm. But you should see our government differently, and our government is acting like as if it's an agent, a, looking. an agent looking yeah. to make money because the FDA should be protecting us from bad research. It should be protecting us from companies that make their research say what they want it to say, and they should be protecting us from all of the people that say like something like testosterone mm -hmm. or vitamins or something else is not worthwhile or it is not helpful. We had 20 studies that said, test, uh, excuse me, vitamin D didn't work. We had more than that before they said oh yeah vitamin d works mm -hmm. so they then said so they said you don't need vitamin d it doesn't work the way they manipulated that study is they made the dose so low and the sh time in between testing like bones and and for cancer they made the time so short that it didn't seem to do anything it didn't show up it didn't. so then the later study said well we want people to take vitamin d because it'll decrease their cancer risk a little bit so and it'll make their bones stronger so they said, oh, we're going to do the studies longer now. And they knew it was going to prove to, to be helpful. Well, but it's more expensive to conduct a longer study. Yes, it when is. When you follow an age cohort over three, five, ten-year period, the database, the investigatory time, the interview time, the statistical manipulation time, all that grows exponentially. But you should trust your government and the NIH and the FDA to actually not have a preconceived goal in testing things yet they do they're looking at you, when you they think said, they should be looking for the truth they should be looking for the truth and they pure should research and pure research and they shouldn't be look i mean they should be looking but for there's no money in it in pure research <laughs> except the serendipitous occasion where they accidentally discover something that's wonderful uh accidentally like viagra it was supposed to be a blood pressure medicine and it's and wonderful. It's, and then they like quadrupled the price, and yeah. now it works for ED. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that it was being tested for one reason, ended up being something else. In that way, by increasing the price because people wanted it more, it didn't have so much competition, it was the first of its kind, then the government played into it saying, okay, you can, you can charge that for that. You can charge $20 a pill. Mm hmm and we're only going to, the insurance companies are only going to give you six a month. So you can only have sex six a month, six times a month. I mean, they're managing our lives and they should be at our beck and call. We should be able to say, don't lie to us so anymore. So is there argument that there are negative side effects if you have sex more than six times a month? No. Or if you take more than six Viagra's a month? No, but the drug company can make I mean, a ton of money by charging $20 a pill. Oh, no, I, I, and then the opposite side is insurance saying... I don't want to pay for more than six pills. That's all we'll allot you. Well, and often they will say, like with birth control pills, we won't pay for that. That's discretionary or volitional. You want to take birth control, so you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. uh, or, Although or, that's now been changed. That has been changed, but back, it, back it in used, the day when I was younger, to be, it, it used to be, be a It used to be against item. the law yeah. to take birth control. Wow. That's back in the in the fifties. Yeah, and then so we, we are evolving. And then it was against the law to take birth control pills if you were unmarried. Right. So first it was if you're married you can't take them. Because everybody knows if you're unmarried, unmarried people don't have sex. Right. Yeah. So and then then it was against the law. People had to break the law to give give young people the benefit of not conceiving. And, and how many years did they study then, the morning after pill? I don't know because of political. I don't know how many. Yeah, thing. how many years? Not because they, they didn't have the it. answer, but because of the political agenda of the vested interests that wanted people not to have access to that because their philosophical orientation was radically opposed to it. We have a government that's supposed to serve us. They should br allow us the drugs we have in Europe that have been tested in Europe. Mm -hmm. They should allow us access to them, even if 
Maybe we have to pay a higher portion of it. They, they should, should allow let us, us buy them from to be adult to I mean, make our own decisions. You can buy the same exact medicine with the same label, the same dosage, the same uh, production. Actually produced in the United States, mm -hmm. sold in Europe for $10 a pill. You buy it here, it's $200 a pill. And Why? it's against the law to bring it in. And it's against the law to go over there and buy it and bring it back. So they're not protecting so, us. They're protecting the companies, and that makes no sense to me. So if you want to, if you want to think about all the ways they can manipulate data, if you're still not sold that they do, here's they can use a small number of patients who are in a certain group that they know something will fail or they know something will succeed. They often use the wrong age group for something. Like they started estrogen in women in the WHI study when the average age was in the I think it was 70, 69. So that's the average age. That means they had people who are 90 taking estrogen that was oral, which gives them all kinds of side effects at that stage when they haven't had estrogen all those years. Mm. So they made, they wanted to make that fail. In fact, they couldn't. So they did the next thing. They changed the headline on, on the... Um, uh, on the uh, press release so that everyone would see that hormones are dangerous. Mm -hmm. Well, hormones, everybody thinks estrogen, when in fact it was the progestin, Provera, mm -hmm. that was dangerous, not estrogen. So everybody went off their estrogen. And doctors they, panicked. Pa People doctors never read panic. the study. I did. <coughs> I read it right away because it, it conflicted with I, what I knew right. about estrogen. So I read the study because I knew it couldn't be true. And then I realized the study really said estrogen's fine. It's just estrogen plus progestin, which was the problem. Mm -hmm. No one, you don't hear people talk about that. It's in the back it's in page, the fine details. in the, it, in the rebuttal. Or it's the still out retraction. there in the, in the public mind, in the mind of many physicians that hormone replacement, i.e. estrogen replacement in women is a dangerous thing that leads to breast cancer. It and so doesn't. they don't recommend it and they won't give it and women are afraid to take it and they've heard these negative messages in the media the media picked it up physicians picked it up it has now that particular research mm -hmm. has been really discounted uh strongly but a lot of people have not evolved into the newer awareness and the american college of OBGYN says still says the very lowest dose which we do with no other drug you know, to keep somebody alive, basically. Right. We use optimal dr drug doses. They say very lowest dose of estrogen for the shortest period of time, which is counterproductive to heart and cholesterol and insulin resistance. It does many good things to prevent aging as well. Well, and then in estrogen, you have three different kinds. And so you can give any or all of those three. Mm -hmm. and, and the question of balance and problem solving that mm -hmm. you do in your office looks to what are the individual symptoms of the woman, what are the side effects of the treatment, what is the goal, whether it's quality of life, ability to move, uh, not feel pain, m move like walk regularly, stand upright and walk. Uh, not have hot flashes. Not have not hot flashes, be able what, to sleep. whatever it might be. So you look at those as individual things, but the media is still saying estrogen. And right. not break, not acknowledging that there are three different kinds. And on testosterone, not acknowledging that every different delivery system creates a different side effect profile. And that's one of the reasons I use pellets, because they have the fewest side effects, mm -hmm. and they act more like our organs, ovaries, and testicles. They act more like that. They're mm -hmm. not the same. But they give us fewer problems. So that's why I choose that. Yet, that's the job of a doctor. A doctor's job is to choose something knowing what they know. Well, if we keep getting false studies, if we get studies that are manipulated and we don't have time to read the whole study and figure out what they did, or if we don't have experience with a certain drug, say somebody didn't have experience with vitamin D. Well, I, I did. I had lots of people on vitamin D. I knew that it improved over long time, long term, it improved their bone density. Well, if you don't know that, then you believe whatever they tell you to believe. Mm -hmm. And then there's these guidelines. American College of OBGYN, American College of Surgery, they give you guidelines which we're supposed to follow, yet if you look at them legally, they're considered the lowest level of care that is possible. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because the least amount of intervention is the best? Well, no, it's the lowest. They're, really, guidelines are used for the legal system. Right. So if you follow the guidelines 
and you do nothing more than that, then you're okay. But if you do less than that, then you're not okay. And guidelines change all the time. Mm -hmm. They come up and they say, oh, this guideline was great 10 years ago. Now, now mm, it doesn't work like that. We've done more research. Mm -hmm. And then you wonder what kind of research have you done? So that's another th another way of manipulating data. Mm -hmm. You can manipulate data so that, let's see, there's you use too low a dose. Like they say, oh, testosterone doesn't work for that. Well, they give them such a small dose. Of course it doesn't work. It's not physiologic. It's not a physiologic dose. So that's one of the things. But all of these things are to either scare us from having our doctor give us the proper advice or they're getting us to take 10 other drugs instead of this one medication because that makes more money for the drug companies. Uh, watch anything on television. Watch any <laughs> sports activity. The One of the primary advertising revenue sources for television is the pharmaceutical industry. And they sell drugs all the time with these wonderful, beautiful, soft commercials. And, and then they say, they don't, and then you can die. They don't tell you what it's for. <laughs> they don't tell you what it's, you know, you need to get X drug because then the flowers will bloom and the sun will come out and the children will sing. Advertising. And it's wonderful. And then at the end, they have this guy in this little flat monotone voice say, not recommended if you have this and this and this and this could kill you and you have to take this. You sound this like routine. that guy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, and, and people are trained not to even hear that part. None of that registers, but they legally have to say it mm -hmm. uh, because lawsuits need to be protected. Right. Yeah. Yep, so, they have to be protected from the lawsuits and, and so that they there, don't get sued for having There's side one effects. other additional point before we run out of time that, that we want to talk about. In the decision-making matrices of the philosophical approach of government and medicine in the United States as opposed to Europe, mm -hmm. well, even in Europe, the same, same issues come up. And it's, it has to do with the concept of social engineering. When you have a volume of people, certain population distributions, and you have a funding base, and you have to provide resources for all those people that come out of that funding base, you have to make hard decisions. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to ask the question, why are we replacing two knees and a 95-year-old overweight woman? Mm -hmm. Who's paying for that? And they why are we doing it? it? And what's the benefit of it? Why do we develop a cancer drug and then allow a hedge fund uh, operator to buy that drug, which was selling at uh, $700 a pill, and within 24 hours of having bought it, jump it up to $15,000 a pill mm -hmm. on his own recognizance just because he can make more money off of it. I mean, the social engineering behind, do we want to provide that medicine to keep people alive, or is it just a commodity that is marketable, is a question for societies to resolve in their political systems, their moral interpretations, their legal uh, decision-making. But those are also involved in the inertia, the resistance to accepting that testosterone, and especially testosterone for women, mm -hmm. is a good and viable treatment that will prevent a lot of negative impacts in the cascade of aging. Well, go governments and insurance companies work on the short term. Right. We've got the money here. What can we spend it on in the short term? So they're always putting out fires, say, with the aging population. They're trying to, they're, they're spending their money on keeping the aging population alive without a quality of life. But then they, if they have that money for the aging population, they can't also spend on prevention. So then they scare us because the, that's the only way to keep the American people from wanting something or petitioning for it. They scare us about testosterone, making labeling it with scary side effects that are not really true unless you use a oral testosterone. So. That's well, another way of misleading us from getting what we need. And, and this is where my cynicism comes in. And this is mine, it's not yours. I know. So I'll take ownership of this. But insurance companies are in the business to make money. They're not in the business to provide services to you so that you can have a better quality of life because when God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. No matter what It they ain't say. about that. It's mm -hmm. about making money and keeping money. So uh, the, that's a, that's the end another. of my apologia about the insurance industry. So we've got... Government that's not working for us on our behalf for our real health because they're, our tax dollars are funding them. They're funding NIH and the FDA and all the other agencies that control what we can have mm -hmm. in the land of the free, okay? And seriously, not free dollars, free, 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 free choice. And then they're also populated by all of these companies who are trying to 
uh, come together and get what they need in terms of making their market share and making more money. So we're in the middle of this. We're not getting what we need. We're not having it paid for by insurance. We're not even allowed to, I mean, we're not even told this is okay and everybody's afraid of it when it can do all of those things to keep you alive. And I had to go to another country to find out. I mean, to actually have it in one chapter in one place. Yes. So at the end of the day, our argument is about the importance for you as a consumer to be aware and to have a relationship with your physician, which involves the right of you and your physician to seek treatment, which in your judgment is best for you, and not to have that controlled by some external source like the FDA, the government, or the pharmaceutical industry, or your insurance company, which says, well, we don't pay for that drug, and we don't think that's good for you, and so on and so forth. So hopefully, you will listen to what we're talking about and become more invested in getting information and demanding from your providers and from your physicians and from the government the services that you would like to have as an informed consumer. Thank you. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.